there, my friend. Welcome to Westbrook Online. What a joy and a blessing that you have dialed in uh, to our services today. And I want to welcome you, and I want to encourage you to begin praying right now that God begins to do a mighty work in your heart and your spirit today. As we get ready to move into our time of service, I just want to say not only a welcome, but I want to encourage you to do your absolute best, if you can, to connect with us. Let us know that you are watching this online service today. Uh, Check in on our Church Center app, uh, our social media, through our website or whatever. We want to know that you are with us, and we want you, a part of our online congregation, to know know that you can lean into us and lean on us for the sake of ministry and blessing as well. Let us know what you're going through. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know that you are with us, and we want to minister to you the very best way that we can. Uh, With that as well, we want to encourage you to be a part of our ministry Uh, this entire summer. Uh, Pray for us. Be faithful stewards. And if you're ready, get back involved with us from an in-person perspective as well. And we would be so blessed by that. If you're traveling and you're watching this online, pray God's greatest blessings uh, upon you this summer also. Now before we go into our time of worship today, let me encourage you before the service is over, uh, take a moment and remember what Christ has done for you in a time of communion. Find a piece of bread. Find a cup of juice, take some time to remember his great sacrifice and his blessing in your life. And then be faithful to sow seeds of blessing into this ministry financially as well. We have so many wonderful things taking place this summer, and you can be a part of it wherever you are across the globe. I'm going to ask if you will, bow your heads and close your eyes. Let's pray. And God, we come to you today and just know that as we open up your word, as we begin the study of the book of Acts uh, today, that God, you will bless us as we seek to live for you. Would you take our, uh, this message, would you take uh, our worship, would you take this time of prayer, God, and begin to move in the hearts and lives of people who are watching this today. And God, we just know uh, that by the power of, of the Holy Spirit that, that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that we can possess in our lives as well. And so, God, we give ourselves to you, and we pray that your mighty power, your mighty spirit will move in us in a magnificent way. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this service. In Jesus we pray, amen. Let's move into our service today, and may God bless you. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Of God, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the good. I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived the goodness of God all my life. 
you probably don't know this about me, but I am dead set on doing what I think is right. In other words, if I'm doing it, it must be right, and everyone else is probably wrong. So, in fact, a long time ago, I, I, I wanted to write a book entitled, Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong. And, and there's some arrogance within that, but also I don't want to do something wrong. I don't want to be the person in the wrong. You know, I think, I think we're all kind of similar in that way where we don't want to be caught being the one that is actually wrong. We want to try to live in a way that's pursuing what is right. None of us want to do something for a majority of our lives only to find out that it was wrong the entire time. For instance, I, I can remember here recently, like within the past few months, I learned something that I thought I knew to be true but wasn't actually true. Annie had hit her shin on something, and the next day I asked her how her knee was, was doing, and she said, fine, it, it wasn't my knee that I hit, though, it was my shin. And I was like, no, that's, that's the same thing. And she's like, no, they're two different body parts. So for the last 35 years, I thought to myself that the shin and the knee were the exact same body part. The terms were just interchangeable. Or, or Annie and I were driving past this, this restaurant and it was called First Watch and I had made the comment that I wanted to try it and I thought it was a restaurant that was based on a firehouse menu. You know, like the First Watch crew at the firehouse, this was their breakfast and brunch menu that they would have and they kind of made this restaurant that symbolized that or that was based off of that. And I was pretty sure that that was true. And I don't know why I thought that was true. I hadn't heard it anywhere before. Maybe I was confusing it with firehouse subs and that idea. And so Annie looked it up and was it true? No, it was not true. In fact, it was way off. It was a reference about some nautical reference to the first work shift on a ship. And so nothing to do with the firehouse. But I thought it was true that entire time. But again, I was wrong on that. Or, or on a more serious note, I can recall some of my early days as a Christian doing what, what I thought was right, condemning all the sinners, thinking that because I could quote scripture to them that I was right and they were wrong. I can recall more than one conversation where things got heated and I came down harshly on people and probably ruined a lot of friendships and relationships in that process and the love of Christ was nowhere to be found within my language. I remember being in Bible college and a professor told us to read Blue Like Jazz as a part of an assignment and I argued with him on it because I was, I was trying to be this, this great Christian and I said, this author, uh, he, he curses, he, he has drinking in his book, he, he smokes a pipe in here and he talks about that. There's no way that, that you can be a follower of Christ and write a book on theology if, if that's what you're behaving like outside of, outside of the church. And, and I was basically saying, I'm not going to read this book. And he pulled me aside one day. He's like, you, you know that Martin Luther loved alcohol. Like, he spoke about it frequently. He said things like, beer is made by men and wine is by God. And he put me in my place basically saying, don't come across as some moralistic snobbish, arrogant Christian. Like, you do realize that you might be wrong on things. Don't confuse moralism with Christianity. I wasn't right about something, and I thought that I was. It's hard to be proven wrong. We don't want to be wrong. We always want to be right. And sometimes we can go most of our lives thinking that we are right about something when in reality we could have been wrong the entire time. And if we're humble enough to accept that, I think that God can do truly great things through us. Which brings us to Saul. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts 9. We've already been introduced to Saul in chapters 7 and 8, albeit somewhat briefly. What we know about him, though, is that he was on a mission to stop the way of Jesus. He was out for blood, and everything he was doing was to stop that thing from happening. He was to stop what he believed to be right. He, he didn't want people following Christ. That was not the way of God. He believed that the way of Christ was against God. That's one of the more interesting things to me about this story is, is he's a devout Jew. He's a Pharisee. He, he's not some complete outsider trying to destroy the church. It's not a story of a barbarian who, who sees the church as a threat. It's the story of a Pharisee 
who wants to protect the way of God. And the only way to do that is to destroy this sect that is popping up in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. And that was his motivation. So let's start here in verse one of chapter nine. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation, the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men The men with Saul stood speechless, for they had heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there is a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to the straight straight street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Before this passage about Saul, we had stories of of Simon the sorcerer and the the Ethiopian eunuch coming to Christ, their conversion stories. And and now, in the midst of some radical conversions, we're we're seeing this story of, of Saul that may be the most radical of the conversions here. And it's all pointing to the same thing. It's, it's pointing to the fact that the kingdom of God is, is an unstoppable force. Notice who takes the center stage in this conversion. It isn't Saul. It isn't Ananias. It isn't Saul's men that were with him. It, it's, it's Christ. He's the one who orchestrates everything. He blinds Saul. He tells him to go to Damascus and wait. And then he tells Ananias to go and restore his eyesight. And, and Christ does that all. He takes Saul, who is a well-known Pharisee that is on a mission to destroy Christ and turns him completely around. And I love this about his conversion. We should know, though, as I said earlier, that what Saul thought he was doing was, was best for the faith. He thought killing and imprisoning these followers of the way was what God would want. He was devout. That's what strikes me the most about his conversion. He was devout, and on the way to Damascus, he was probably praying for strength to carry on this mission from God, this higher mission of ending this group that was threatening the way of the faith, of the way of Judaism. He really thought the entire time he was following and defending God. He was kind of like Jake and Elwood Blues in the sense that he thought he was on a mission from God to thwart the sect that was leading people away from God. He wasn't some heathen Gentile or Samaritan. He was, he was a devout Jew, and he was trying to tell people why they were wrong. He was in the right. They were in the wrong. And that's why Jesus takes the center stage of this conversion, because who else could have enough power to change someone like that? Saul thought he was doing right and good. There's even that moment where Saul asked the blinding light where he says, who are you, Lord? Not addressing Jesus directly in that, in that question. Not even addressing Jesus as Lord with a capital L. He is still showing that sign of respect by saying Lord, but he's not even showing him the sign of respect by saying you are the Lord with a capital L. It's almost like he's stubborn. 
and he's stubborn enough to still not want to acknowledge that it is Jesus who is confronting him. Like how many people can emit a powerful light like that? Jesus basically has to spell out who he is in order for, for Saul to finally come to terms with the truth that he is in the wrong. It's important to note that this isn't out of the ordinary for, for Luke. All throughout his gospel and in the book of Acts, he has this constant weaving narrative where he, he argues that the mission can't be stopped because it is of God and God is in the center of it all. And everything we've covered thus far in the book of Acts has been miraculous, it's been, it's been wonderful, it's, it's been something that we wouldn't ever expect within the church. Even today it's something that we might not expect within the church. But it is something that God is behind and because of that, we see powerful forces at work. We see things happen that we never thought would happen. We see truly that the kingdom of God is unstoppable. The whole story is centered around Christ. The disciples might have been asking, now what? Now what are we supposed to do in light of Christ's ascension? But, but God was making it clear, this is unstoppable. The conversion of Saul isn't just this personal conversion. It's, it's part of the history of the church. The power of the conversion isn't just found in Saul becoming Paul and writing most of the New Testament. The power of the conversion is Christ taking one of the most prominent, threatening, stubborn figures in the Jewish faith and showing that his transformation can change everything. The movement, the way, it, it was unstoppable. The church couldn't be silenced. Even in the face of persecution, God was demonstrating to the believers that he was at the center of it all. And when we remember that Christ is at the center of the conversion, we remember another important truth. And that is that conversion isn't personal. It's communal. I love how commentator William Willimon puts it in his commentary over Acts. He says, Conversion is not an individualistic attainment or personal possession. Conversion moves one into the care and nurture of the body of believers. As we shall see in Acts 10 through 11 and as the account of Peter's vision and conversion, one never becomes so wise or adept at faith that conversion stops or one is immune from divine surprises. Conversion keeps on happening. The turning continues within the community. We know that Christ is at the center of it all because of the power of the community within the conversion. Ananias even expresses some doubt. He expresses some pushback with, with, with Jesus, some objections over to going to visit Saul. This was the man who was trying to kill them. Did they not understand that? Did Jesus not understand that? He wanted to imprison the believers. Why should he go there? But Jesus says go and Ananias does. And notice how the passage ends He's baptized and he eats. Baptism and the Eucharist, communal acts. He is being accepted into that community to the point where Saul is referred to as Brother Saul. Not enemy Saul, but Brother Saul. It's why in Galatians, Paul writes that he was given the right hand of fellowship, the amount of grace that is shown to him, even though he had tried to kill or imprison several of them. That kind of grace, that is something that could only be shown if Christ is at the center of it all. This kingdom that Christ spoke about is truly what he said it would be. It's radical grace, it's forgiveness, it's, it's what you, you thought impossible could be possible. I don't know when the last time was that you shared in a meal with someone who tried to kill you, but I, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I'd be w eager to, to do so. I'd probably say, all is forgiven, no harm, no foul. You just didn't know that you were doing was wrong. It's okay, now we can be friends. Like, that's a little intimidating. Rereading this story throughout the past couple of weeks has, has reminded me of a few things. We aren't quick to admit when we get things wrong. We don't show as much grace as we should and could to others and to ourselves. And it's hard for us to see that conversion is an ongoing communal process because it brings us back to the idea that we might be wrong on things. We want to make it personal, but it isn't just personal, it's part of a community. 
Just like Paul's conversion is part of the history of the church, so too is yours. And it's an ongoing communal process. It's something we call in the church sanctification, but it's the ongoing nature of refining, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it at all. One of the most well-known songs inside and outside of the church is Amazing Grace. And even if you're unfamiliar with Christianity, you might recognize it because of its frequent use at funerals. If you've researched the song, you'll know that John Newton wrote it after he thought he was going to die while navigating a ship ship through a terrible storm. He prayed out for God to save him, and he did. And even though he had been raised knowing the scriptures, he had walked away from faith, and when he was saved from that storm, a renewed faith came over him, and he thanked God for saving him through the storm. And every year, he would pray the same prayer of thanks to God for saving him that night. We love telling that story because it really is a powerful story. A man man came to faith during a crisis and devoted his life to God. Being spared from death was the hour he first believed. And if you know anything else about him, you'll know that after all of this, he went on to help in the abolition of slavery within England. But what you may not know is that there's a gap that occurs from the hour I first believed until his work to abolish slavery in England. A gap that consists of his continued work in the slave trade after the hour he first believed. Another six years passed of him working on the slave trade until a stroke stopped him from being able to travel as much as he did. And even after he couldn't travel with them anymore, he still invested in the company during the slave trading And then another 33 years would pass before he began writing against slavery. So almost 40 years after the hour he first believed to when he began the work that he is well known for. That hour he first believed would lead to six years of him working and supporting a slave trade and another 33 years before he would publicly renounce what he had been a part of. To admit that he had been wrong and something needed to change. That time he thought he was right and then realized he was actually wrong. The power of our conversion reflects the radical power of Christ to change anything. If he can change a murderer, power-driven, arrogant person such as Paul, he can change anything. The power of our conversion reflects the radical power of Christ to change anything. But it's, it's hard for us to believe that, isn't it? God, God can't change me. Maybe God can forgive what I've done, but the church could never accept me. What happens if I make more mistakes? We find all these reasons to be ashamed when in reality, when we don't share that story, we silence the story of the radical power of Christ's ability to change anything. Anytime I hear someone's story about how they came to Christ, you know what I'm thinking about? I'm not thinking about everything they're telling me they did. I'm not thinking about who they once were. I'm not thinking about, oh my gosh, do we need to turn this person in? Those aren't questions going through my mind. The, the thing that goes through my mind is, is how powerful Christ is in this person's life. He takes the center stage of your story. You can tell your story to me all you want, but but what I hear is, is the power of Christ in your life and how he has radically transformed your life. And everything else just kind of passes away because I see that you encountered something with Christ and you are still trying to understand it to this day. The fear and shame we have with our story, it's really about us. It's It's our fear to admit that we were wrong. It's our shame about what we have done. It's our fear about worrying what others might think. It's our shame in thinking people might look at us differently. But that's not what we see in in Saul's conversion. True, some people would remind Paul later on of, of who he once was. They would say, don't you remember? But Paul would always beat them to the punch and say, yes, yes, I do remember. And that is what I once was. And so were you. Whether we like to admit it or not, we don't have our act together most of the time and we're still in the process of this communal conversion or sanctification. We can sometimes be like John Newton and accept Christ and then 40 years later realize, oh, we were doing something wrong this entire time as well. 
The power of our conversion reflects the radical power of Christ to change anything. So if you're sitting here thinking like, what does it mean to follow Christ? Maybe you're thinking about getting baptized. Maybe you want to take that step and you're worried, ashamed, and afraid, whatever it might be. Know this, that just as Saul's conversion is a part of the history of the church, so too is, is your conversion. It's part of our history. And if you've experienced judgment and shame from the community, then shake the dust off your feet and move on. Because that's a community that doesn't keep Christ at the center. I'm reminded of all the times I've gotten things wrong, which are insurmountable. And I am humbled by those moments because it makes me see people in a similar light of who are trying to do what is right and don't realize that what you're doing is actually wrong. We get things wrong, we falter, and that's not the point of the conversion. The point is to keep Christ at the center. It's about showing his power, not our failures. It's about him. So my challenge to you is to take a step. Take a step to share your story. Take a step to be a part of the history of the church and that conversion. Be blinded by the light of Christ and admit you were wrong because it's not about you, it's about Christ. And when you share that story, you share the power that Christ has in this world today still. You remind people that the kingdom of God is unstoppable because if if Christ can transform you, he can transform all. If he can transform me, he can transform all. Take pride in that story of how Christ has, has radically transformed your life. Don't be ashamed or afraid in the midst of it. It's not about what you did, but it's about what he did and does every single day in our lives. And similarly, that conversion, that, that step Know that you'll be welcomed by community with open arms that say, Brother Saul, come and be baptized and share in a meal with us because you are part of this community now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful and grateful for you and for your work in our lives and how you continue to humble us and remind us to look to you and to keep you as the center of our lives. Lord, may we never forget that the power of our conversion reflects the radical power of Christ to change everything. That he can change anything in our lives or in the lives of others because he is truly unstoppable. So God, may we see ourselves with the same grace that you see us and may we give ourselves the same love that you unconditionally pour out on us every single day. We love you and praise your name. Amen. Father, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your presence here with us today. And God, I pray that as we pour out our praise and worship to you, that you would speak to our hearts. God, that you would continue the transformation of our minds. And God, that nothing else would be more important to us than our love and devotion to you. We love you today, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray and sing. Amen. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this world. Never wanna leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want. I'm sorry 
When I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you And I'm sorry When I come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started